2nd of September. Uh, a quick review of the markets for this morning. Uh, we're going to do a more thorough payrolls preview closer to the event this afternoon. Uh, what I'll also try to, to do after on farms, because typically the, the late afternoon in Europe tends to get quite quiet once the data has passed and the volatility has moved on, is that I'll do a more in-depth kind of look at Italy as well and how um, that might play out on Sunday, because obviously it's the referendum. But uh, looking firstly at a couple of charts and <clears throat> overall news flow has been relatively quiet overnight, not really too much to speak of. So on a morning like this, I tend to look at the, the lead, if you like, or passing the baton from continent to continent. And the close on Wall Street was a, a negative one. The likes of the S&P and the Dow were down just over a third of 1%. But the Nasdaq has really uh, underperformed this week. Uh, the Nasdaq was down 1.6% last night. Uh, just looking or bringing the Nasdaq into shot for really this is the week, uh, particularly the sell-offs that we've had in the last two or three days have been very aggressive. <clears throat> if you think about it, uh, the appreciation of oil of over 10% certainly helped prop up that sector uh, the last 48 hours or so. Uh, and so the Nasdaq not getting the benefit of that move given the lack of that associated sector. So. Uh, it's certainly been under pressure. IT was underperforming last night at the close of Wall Street. Uh, and then that negative close, well, first of all, technically looking at the S&P last night, uh, we've been watching this 91 and a half level uh, very closely. That defined the previous record high that acted as some resistance before we broke through on the 21st and acted as support thereafter. Well, after the European close last night, that also gave way uh, and we, we, we've trended lower this morning. So uh, lower close on Wall Street, fed through into Asia, which was relatively quiet, I guess, and, and negative trades then feeding through into the open this morning. Uh, obviously, there's some net negatives looming. Uh, looking at the DAX here on the week from the 28th and where we opened, we obviously had that slight gap down um, the market kind of initial nervousness that Italy was closing in. That was when we had really the biggest day of, I would say, uh, volatility in the Italian banks. That was when yields in Italy also spiked up. But midweek, that was when the ECB kind of countered that via their source comments to Reuters, talking about that they would be happy to and able to step in uh, and up their purchases of BTPs, which is Italian bonds, if there is a spike in their yields. Uh, that alleviated some concerns, but then uh, technically then just breaking down again uh, more recently and and this is kind of as I think to be expected from a directional bias going into the weekend's risk event uh, obviously we've kind of continued to drift lower we've taken out that 10,500 level uh, and we're already down to well test but yet to firmly go through that S1 level in the DAX this morning so negative tone that's then in the risk assets leading to uh, a bit of a boost for gold this morning, uh, which obviously has seen some, you know, 1200 that break. That was a really powerful move when that went. Uh, we has provided as well resistance on the recovery that we had in the following few days. Uh, but I guess this is the kind of range that we want to be looking at when we come back into markets on Monday morning, dependent on what's really happened with this Italian situation. Uh, a resignation and certainly a test back up at 1200 could well be on the cards. Uh, a $20 move in gold in, in one day is not by any means uh, unheard of. So a little bit of a bounce back in recovery in tandem then with a downtick in equities uh, heading into some of these events coming up. Uh, another asset that moved a lot yesterday and, and may have caught a few by surprise was really the strength of the pound. Uh, pretty phenomenal move upside two point gain at, uh, at really the most this is really this candle I'm looking at here we had slightly weaker manufacturing data but it did uh, if you scratch below the surface continue to show price pressures of building uh, in the manufacturing sector and so that inflation angle is still very much uh, a prominent theme but most uh, all the biggest catalysts came from David Davis and uh, Dysel Bloom from the Eurogroup president talking about we're happy to pay as a country to, to maintain access to the single market, that we'd pay for that privilege. 
uh, and therefore Dieselbloom fired back saying uh, welcoming those comments talking about we may have to have a look then about how Britain can have access uh, to the internal market and as such that really caused a, a dramatic appreciation of the pound but then technically that 127 really came into play pretty much to the tick which was also on the daily chart we had a, a test and a bounce before the eventual break and that was a really strong move and we did break through and obviously then we had the algo uh, overnight flash crash which is that really big wick on that candlestick so 127 I'd say is a key one to look, keep an eye on on the upside uh, through here then the next level of real significance is that 2806 which we were of course watching very closely throughout the summer period because that defined the lowest point that we had in the immediate aftermath of Brexit so this was kind of the 6th of July uh, the kind of week after or week and a half after Brexit itself uh, and then when that broke as well that was kind of caused if you remember what happened on the, the weekend here on the 4th or 5th of October that was when we had that Tory conference and hard Brexit calls so uh, I think 27 is a big level even bigger though is when we start getting up to 128.06 uh, so things to just bear in mind uh, moving on though as I say I don't want the briefing to, to carry on too long this morning because uh, ultimately this well to go over again non-farms mornings typically from a liquidity point of view is not a great uh, trading environment if you think about any large institutional type flow uh, it's unlikely they're going to be too active in the market ahead of such a big event. It almost becomes self-fulfilling. If no one's in the market anyway, it makes those conditions even worse for them to operate in. Uh, and so just be a little bit careful. Uh, I heard a good conversation with Vast with his, his guys uh, who are trading live funds in that what you want to be doing is not getting in a situation where you're already, um, let's say, on the back foot or you've um, exposed yourself to any type of significant loss in what otherwise is a fairly illiquid quiet market ahead of what is the main event where if there is this outside um, scenario and it's a big market moving figure which I don't think is going to happen today but if it were then you want to have ammunition ready to be able to trade that event so it's a bit of patience and discipline waiting for that to, to materialize but uh, just looking here at the moment uh, S&P just squeezing a little lower again so just keeping an eye on that low uh, that we had well this was the the usual I'm sure um, Vast will be aware of this the, the kind of ramp capital the final half an hour of Wall Street uh, bids that you get in the market quite often happens uh, probably a buy side imbalance into the close on Wall Street but keep an eye on that 2186 here on the downside um, but let's just take a quick look at payrolls then uh, as I say uh, Piers is going to jump on actually and, uh, and give you a more thorough run through but in general terms this is kind of how the week has panned out so far and uh, we've had pretty good data actually out of the US US GDP 3.2 percent second reading of uh, third quarter growth was revised up uh, it's the highest growth rate in two years in fact when you're talking about the US then you move on, you've had ADP employment change, this is the private payrolls number. Uh, we had a down revision to the previous, but the actual monthly figure, 216. So again, a pretty solid figure, was uh, above market expectations as well, uh, as the highest figure since June. Then you look at Chicago PMI, again, it's the highest reading since January of 2015. As four of the five barometers, i.e. the constituents of the report, they all increased. So very solid Chicago PMI, probably the highlight of the economic data in terms of the strength of the ones that we've seen this week. Then you had ISM manufacturing, that as well, 53.2. You can see here matching the high from summer, June of this year. The highest reading in five months, new orders, production, inventories and raw materials came in stronger than the prior month. But the employment constituent growth, uh, growth had slowed down a touch. Uh, so heading into non-farms actually uh, you know, the scene has been set and yeah, I'd say it's actually on the, the more positive side therefore this is when you start to, to formulate what could be then a whisper type number and by that I mean where would the market be positioned 
for what type of number. And the median consensus for payrolls today is 175. I would say that's pretty fair value for where probably the market is expecting that number to come in. Could even be, given the strength of the data points that we've had, uh, a slight upside bias to that figure. Um, but really, this is the, the key picture I wanted to show you because today is a little bit unique. I think last payrolls, uh, I wasn't actually here uh, at the time when it came out. I think I was uh, away that day off the desk. but. Uh, I was informed it was probably one of the most muted reactions in the market that we've seen in a long time. That could also be the case today. What is more important is, at this point, a hike is priced at roughly 95 to 100% assured for December 14th. So it's not about the interest rate hike. What is important is these projections. So what we're looking at here, this is the current point of where we sit and then what we this is this dotted line here the second highest that's the FOMC September 2016 dot plot projections so on the 14th of December not only will they announce what's likely an interest rate hike but it's important because we get the updated summary of economic projections from the Fed and also a press conference with Janet Yellen so as Mohamed El Arian was saying yesterday was it's about the subsequent hikes thereafter and the rate in which those hikes occur in 2017 that's really key i.e. how steep or shallow is this trajectory of interest rate hikes through the period of 2017 that's what today's economic data is going to help um, help decipher and actually you're looking further forward into the future and therefore the net result of intraday volatility could be negated because this effectively is just one part of the jigsaw puzzle that the Fed will look at in order to see how aggressive can they be with hiking rates next year. Obviously they've come well short of what they telegraphed in December 2015. They hiked and said we'd hike four times. The Fed do not want to be in a situation again where you hike and say you're going to hike three or four times and then it ends up materializing that you do one or none. So that's really key what you're looking out for uh, as a more broader terms from today's reading. Looking at some of the major banks, I'm going to post this into the chat room so you can have a look yourself. I would say though reading Nomura, Bank of America, Barclays, Goldman, their views on non-farms, it's, it's a pretty boring read to be honest. There's not really much um, exciting that we're expecting from this data. Just looking at the headline numbers that most are expecting, 160, 200, 170, 175, 200 at Goldman's um, and so on. So the actual ranges are pretty tight around the median consensus and so not many people are expecting this great outlier to occur. That being said, I would say that even if we had a number, um, let's say 90,000, 100,000, that's not going to change what the Fed are going to do with December hike. What it will only do is then be part of the calculation for probably a more dovish hike would occur in December. If the number came in at hypothetically 5,000, 10,000, let's say it was incredibly weak, uh, I still think that won't affect the December hike because typically whenever I've seen a number like that come in that bad, Generally, what it means is that there's probably a one-off reason for why that's happened. A statistical revision, a seasonal pattern, a one-off reason. And so it pretty much gets discounted when it's that bad. Uh, a very, very strong number, I think, today needs to be up knocking on the door of 300,000. And then you might see a bit of a, uh, a reaction of a strong move in the dollar to the upside, another pop in, uh, up in U.S. yields as the rate trajectory of 2017 gets a little bit more aggressive. Um, so that's kind of how I'd view today. You're kind of looking for real extremities to influence that Fed um, rate hike process. Uh, the other thing, of course, as I say, I'll talk about this more later on this afternoon, uh, so I won't go into too much detail, uh, but a lot of questions coming about the, the timing of the Italian referendum. Uh, so this is just a broad snapshot uh, exit polls on major TV stations. This is London time. That's going to be at 10 p.m. But they've proved unreliable in the past. The first projections and pollsters will start coming out towards 11 p.m. 
on Sunday night. So really the currency market might start to see volatility in the overnight session, but obviously the Italian bond market doesn't open until seven, the Italian stock market, and actually I would say the Italian banks are gonna be the most sensitive and gonna see the most price action on this result, whether relief rally or they get hit. And that's not gonna occur until eight o'clock. So even when we come in, there could still be opportunities um, relevant for index futures. Um, from Eurex Open at 7, but then also through the cash open on Monday morning. So that's how the, the kind of land lies for today's session. Um, looking else at the calendar, so you've got UK construction PMI that is coming up at 9.30. I'll definitely keep an eye on that given the proximity we are to 127 on the upside, but sitting around 90 pips away from that level, construction PMI uh, doesn't really have the influence to push the price that much uh, but certainly could help add fuel the trend if it is a very strong number for a retest at some point uh, and then really you're looking for the 130 figure to influence the dollar is going to be the driver today on the back of the numbers maybe not so much of a sterling uh, lead day as, as what we had yesterday so uh, enjoy the session guys uh, as I say Piers will be on to run you through payrolls later I'll talk Italy more in the afternoon uh, but have a good day and I'll see you in the chat room.